Hello dreamers and welcome to The Sleepy Scholar, the podcast that helps you learn in your dreams. I'm Debbie and tonight as you snuggle under your warm covers, we'll witness the creation of a mysterious round tower that has stood over an Irish fishing village for the best part of a thousand years. If my story brings you peace and comfort, please consider subscribing to the channel. Your support fuels my passion for sharing these old tales with you. Let's take a moment to unwind before we begin our story. Close your eyes and take a deep breath in, filling your lungs with peace and calm. Hold it a moment and then slowly exhale releasing any tension or stress that you might be carrying. Let the weight of the day melt away and allow yourself to be present in this peaceful moment. Imagine yourself standing on the rocky shores of a small Irish fishing village. The sun is beginning to set, casting a warm golden glow over the landscape. The air is fresh and salty, filled with the scent of the sea. You can hear the gentle lapping of the waves against the boats docked at the pier and the distant call of seagulls as they settle in for the night. Picture the colourful cottages lining the shore, their lights twinkling as evening approaches. Friendly faces smile and wave, adding to the sense of community and tranquility. Laughter and soft chatter blend with the soothing sounds of the ocean. As you walk along the shore, you feel the cool breeze on your face. Each step takes you further away from your daily concerns, closer to a state of complete relaxation. The rhythmic sound of waves becomes your guide, lulling you into a state of deep, restful calm. In the distance, you see the majestic Kilala Round Tower, standing tall against the twilight sky. It has stood here for centuries, a silent witness to countless stories and legends. It radiates a sense of timelessness and strength, reminding you that you too are part of a much larger story, one filled with wonder and magic. As you find a comfortable spot to sit on a weathered stone wall by the shore. 
You gaze up at the tower, its silhouette now framed by a sky painted with hues of orange, pink and purple. A friendly old fisherman tells you it has stood for almost a thousand years since the time when Vikings raided this coast. Monks used it as a place of refuge to hide with their precious books. On stormy nights, the villagers still believe you can hear the monks chanting prayers from within its round walls. Allow yourself to be fully immersed in this moment, letting go of any remaining tension. You are safe. You are at peace. And you are ready to drift into a restful sleep. Tonight we will hear the mysterious story of the creation of this round tower. According to the local lore of the old people. So, when you're ready, close your eyes and let's solve. The Mason's Riddle Fado, Fado In the once sleepy fishing village that we now know as Malahide on the east coast of Ireland there lived a man of exceptional no, supernatural skill on Gubon Ser, the legendary stonemason who was said to be born of the East Shi, such was his unparalleled skill. Up and down the country, the man had left towering monuments, intricate carvings, and impenetrable castles of such magnificence that his name was renowned far beyond Ireland's shores. One misty morning, as the sun painted his village with the dawn's dewy glow, the Gobon Ser set off on a voyage for another wealthy patron. He bid farewell to his expectant wife, Dervla, feeling a nagging worry. Would this child finally be a son to carry on the legacy of stone carving? The villagers whispered excitedly about a gifted heir who might surpass even his father's creativity, envisioning magnificent structures standing tall against the sea. Back in their modest home by the sea, Dervala quietly bore the burden of her community's expectations. She moved through the village, feeling the weight of their silent hopes on her shoulders. She already had two daughters, and she knew everyone yearned for her to finally produce a son. But when her time came, fate had determined that she would deliver a perfect baby girl. In the stillness of the night, with the gentle crackling of the hearth and the distant murmur of the sea, Dervla held her newborn daughter close. Tears of joy streamed down her face as she gazed into the baby's sea-blue eyes. She felt a surge of love and protectiveness, but, but also a heavy burden of guilt and worry. Dervla knew that if word got out about another girl, it would be seen as a failure. 
She feared being shamed and didn't want her daughter to feel unwanted. Determined to find a solution, Dervila slipped quietly out of Malahide under the cover of night. The cool breeze carried the scent of blooming heather and the song of a blackbird. The tiny child, unaware of the journey, was wrapped snugly in warm blankets, her soft breaths blending with the night sounds. Dervila's heart ached with each step, but her resolve remained steadfast. She made her way to a neighbouring village, hoping to find an answer. The stars above twinkled like guardians, casting gentle light on her path. Dervila arrived just as the busy market was coming to life at the break of day. The scent of freshly baked bread wafted through the crisp morning air, mingling with the earthy aroma of just picked vegetables and herbs. Stalls overflowed with bounties of crimson apples, orange carrots and deep purple beets, the colours saturated in the glow of sunrise. Chatter and laughter echoed across the square as villagers exchanged greetings and bartered for goods. Dervila surveyed the scene, scanning the gathering crowd for a familiar face, when eventually she came upon her childhood friend, Maeve. The years had treated Maeve well, transforming her into an extraordinary young mother, with radiant skin and sparkling eyes. As they hugged and caught up on each other's lives, memories flooded back of their carefree days, spent exploring the woods and meadows of their village, their laughter echoing through the trees. It was as if the years since their shared childhood had just disappeared and the two women chatted as if they had never been apart. After a time, Maeve's expression turned somber and she confided that she had just given birth to her tenth son without a daughter in sight. Dervila's heart ached for her friend knowing how much she had always longed for a little girl to love and cherish among all her rowdy sons. She was, of course, grateful for a healthy child, but her eyes glistened with unshed tears for the daughter she believed she would never meet. Reluctantly, Dervila suggested a desperate solution. They could swap babies and raise each child as their own. Neither of their families knew that they had given birth yet and this solution seemed to be staring them both in the face. The weight of the decision hung in the air between them, a tangible presence. After making a solemn promise to provide the best life for each child, the women's hearts were heavy with uncertainty. Dervila gently cradled Maeve's beautiful baby boy, feeling torn between love and fear. 
she couldn't shake the doubts that crept into her mind. Would this little baby possess the intelligence, skill and cunning expected by her husband Goban? As she gazed into the peaceful face of the sleeping infant, she knew that no matter what, she would do everything in her power to give him the very best in life. After months of eager anticipation, the Gabon Ser finally returned to his village to meet his newborn son. He marvelled at the tiny bundle in his arms and proudly named him Pather. The villagers gathered around, their faces glowing with curiosity and hope. As the years passed, it became clear that this child was not like his siblings. While he seemed to have inherited his father's strength and determination, he lacked the sharp wit and skill that were expected of a mason of such renown. The Goban Ser couldn't help but feel a twinge of disappointment every time he saw his son struggle with tasks that came so effortlessly to him. He knew he would have to work hard to create a deserving heir from this child. As Pather grew into a young man, his father reckoned he'd need a clever wife to help him reach his potential. So, one day, as they chipped away at the stones that would become the blocks they needed for their next job, the Gobon Ser presented Pather with an unusual challenge. To sell a sheep's hide to a young woman and return home with both the hide and its price. Pather's heart sank at the thought of convincing someone to part with their money for nothing in return. But he took on the challenge, determined to prove himself worthy of his family name. Pather set off through the lush green fields the sweet scent of wildflowers in the air, hoping to find the clever young woman who would help him complete his task and prove his worth. Evening after evening he'd go wandering in search of the woman who'd answer his prayers. Despite his persistence, the locals met Pather's modest offer with scorn and derision, causing his confidence to waver. But one misty evening, the trees stilled their leaves and the seabirds hushed their calls. Pather heard a voice so musical it seemed to come from another world. As Pather rounded the bend in the winding road, he came upon a fair young maiden tending to her usual chores by a babbling brook. Her long hair was swept loosely into a bun to keep it out of her way while she scrubbed, rinsed and wrung out her basket of clothes. She seemed oblivious to the world around her as she sang familiar old lullabies to herself. At first glance, Ashling seemed like a picture of youth and purity. But... Beneath her undeniable beauty lay a mind brimming with knowledge and wisdom 
far beyond her years. Those who dared underestimate her would quickly learn that she possessed a formidable will and an unwavering determination, forged by her insatiable thirst for adventure and purpose. Pather's soul stirred within him, realising with utmost certainty that this was the woman he wanted to spend the rest of his life with as his cherished wife. Nervously, Pather presented his feeble offer, but Ashling immediately saw beyond it. She could see that this handsome young man was trying desperately to prove himself to someone. They chatted until the sun set, and finally, with a kind smile and a flutter of love in her heart, she agreed to buy the hide. First, she carefully removed the wool she needed for spinning, and then she returned the unwanted skin to Pather for a decent price. With each passing moment, Ashling found herself more and more enamoured by his kindness, humour and impeccable manners, but most of all, his potential for greatness. As their eyes met, her heart skipped a beat, and before long, she knew that she had fallen deeply in love. When news of the encounter reached his ears, Pather's father was anxious to meet the girl. When Ashling arrived, the Gobonsair searched her face, looking for any sign of deception or ill intent. But all he saw reflected in her eyes was a bright intellect and bold curiosity. As they spoke, he found himself unexpectedly moved by her. For though she was but a slip of a girl, her spirited determination reminded him of his own energy at her age. Perhaps this Ashling was the partner his son needed, one who could inspire Pather to reach his true potential. And so, with the Gobonsair's blessing, the two were soon married, eager to embark on their journey through life together. On the other side of the country, by the wild Atlantic, A. O'Connell, his stature still imposing despite the lines of age etching into his once smooth face, held himself with a commanding presence atop his vibrant young steed. His hawk-like eyes, sharp and scrutinising, took in the familiar sight of his home village of Kilala. As he aged, A couldn't help but feel a heavy weight of regret settle upon his shoulders. He had squandered so many years and vast amounts of his wealth on frivolous and meaningless pursuits. The memories of lavish feasts that once filled his halls with laughter and merriment now echoed hollowly in his mind. The gold and silver goblets, once symbols of his status and power, now seemed nothing more than trinkets. As he looked back, A realised that his wealth could have been better spent, leaving a lasting legacy. Time was a cruel master, 
and A could only lament the wasted opportunities that could never be reclaimed. Determined and resolute, he made a solemn vow to use the last of his fortune to erect a lasting monument in stone. For years he had dreamt of an imposing round tower that would stand tall above the sea, its presence dominating the landscape for miles upon miles. It would be crafted from the finest limestone and sandstone, carefully selected to withstand the test of time and become a lasting symbol of his legacy. The mere sight of it would spark envy in all who laid eyes upon it along the western seaboard. But he realised that Only an exceptional craftsman could bring this vision to life. Someone who possessed not only skill and precision, but also the ability to shape history with their hands. Word of the legendary stonemason, the Gobon Ser, had reached a and he knew deep in his heart that this was the man who could help him achieve his ambitions. With a renewed sense of purpose, A sent messengers to seek out the fabled craftsman, hoping to convince him to take on this monumental task. He envisioned a tower That would not only be a testament to his life, but also a beacon of inspiration and pride for generations to come. The journey ahead was uncertain, but A was determined to leave a legacy that would endure, a monument that would speak of his transformation and newfound wisdom. There was no doubt that the compensation for the job was generous. But most importantly, the Gabon Ser saw this as an opportunity to create his magnum opus. He agreed to the commission with gladness. But first he would have to travel the breadth of the country with his apprentice Pather, whose abilities he still doubted. Together, the father and son bid farewell to their wives, knowing that this was one of their most significant tasks yet. That very day, the pair set off together, an awkward silence between them. After only an hour of travelling, the Gabon Ser turned to his son. Shorten the road, he beseeched him. How can I shorten the road? replied Pather, very confused. Very well, grunted the father, shaking his head. It is better for us to turn back. And so they made some excuses when they returned to their wives. The following morning, they set off again. And after just two hours, the Gobon Ser insisted yet again that his son should shorten the road. Alas, poor Pather remained just as puzzled by this request and, much to everyone's frustration, the men returned home for the second time. This time Ashling was getting fed up with these false starts. Pather explained to her that the Gabon Ser had told him to shorten the road. How could I shorten the road? said he, as exasperated as he was perplexed. 
Ashling was no Amadan and understood immediately what was expected of him. She advised her husband, Well, you are no good when you could not tell an old yarn. Let it be a lie or the truth. So on the third day as they set upon their journey, the Gobonsir whispered to his son, Shorten the road. Finally understanding the task at hand, Pather unlocked something deep in his soul. Unbeknownst to anyone, Pather possessed the heart of a poet. The Gobon Ser was astonished by the skill of his son as he suddenly spoke with the eloquence of a true bard. As they walked, Pather spun yarn after yarn, transporting them from the grassy country tracks to fantastic realms of bold warriors, meddling fairies, and ancient gods walking the earth in times long forgotten. The hours and miles seemed to melt away as Pather wove a tapestry of tales, his voice rising and falling with the cadence of a true Shanhi. Though the journey was long, Pather's stories made it feel as though they had arrived at their destination in the blink of an eye. The Gobon Ser breathed deeply the crisp, salty air of the picturesque village of Kilala. The cool breeze brushed against his skin as he surveyed the landscape, his eyes taking in every detail with keen interest. In his mind, he could picture the great round tower a grand project that their patron had commissioned them to create. The men wasted no time in setting to work. The sharp chipping of chisels against sandstone filled the air, accompanied by the rhythmic thumping of hammers driving wedges into the stone. The men worked in perfect harmony, their movements synchronised and precise as they expertly shaped and moulded the sandstone. Every strike echoed through the village a powerful symphony of creation. In the background, The gentle rustling of leaves and birdsong provided a tranquil backdrop to the intense labour of these skilled craftsmen. Each scrape and tap carried a sense of dedication and purpose, as if they were not just shaping stone, but creating something truly magnificent. The elements showed no mercy, sweat beading on their brows as the salty strands of their hair tangled in the wind, while they toiled tirelessly from first light until the moon rose high. Day after gruelling day, week on week, they battled lashing rain shrieking wind and warm sun as they shaped the stone as if it were clay in their capable hands. The tower soared into the azure sky, dominating the landscape for leagues around. The Gobon Ser knew in his heart this was his greatest work yet and yet he could finally see the true artistry in his son, a gifted craftsman in his own right. 
Together they had created something truly stunning and enduring. However, just as the magnificent tower neared completion, their patron A became paranoid. He feared these two men were only reaching their zenith and would soon erect a tower to eclipse his own. Consumed by mistrust and suspicion, A devised a sinister scheme to abandon the Gobonser and Pather atop the nearly finished tower. One silent night, as the masons rested atop the tower, A stealthily removed the scaffolding, leaving the men to perish in the open sky. But A wasn't as quiet as he had assumed and the men were jolted awake by a loud crash as the envious patron dropped the ladder with a clatter. In an instant, the Gobonser realised they were stranded high above the ground, with no way down. Calmly and steadily, The Gobonser called down to his patron, confessing he had left a vital tool at home and could not complete the tower without it. The Calm Augustirch, he named it, claiming it would make the tower the most wondrous one for miles. For he knew A was a vain man and would not miss a chance to outshine his rivals. Determined to erect the perfect tower, A commanded his own son to embark on a quest across the country in search of this peculiar tool. This must be a truly special implement, one that A's soft hands had certainly never grasped before. Anxious to behold this tool himself, A eagerly awaited his son's return, picturing all the marvellous feats he could accomplish with its power. Within the day, the young emissary found the home where he was greeted by Dervila and the quick-witted Ashling. As soon as she heard what he had come to fetch, she understood that the men were in trouble. This tool the man sought was not real. It was an old trick of the trade and alerted her to a problem. Ashling had often worried that their growing fame for the mastery of their art would eventually put them in harm's way and it seemed that that day had finally arrived. Despite her fears for their safety, she took a deep breath and put into action a plan that would turn the tables on the men's cruel master. Keeping a cool head, Ashling graciously gestured for the man to take a seat at her kitchen table adorned with bluebells and marigolds in a clay jug. She served him steaming bowls of hearty stew, accompanied by freshly baked soda bread and a goblet of the finest mead. The man's eyes widened in surprise and gratitude as he savoured each bite feeling like a king himself after such a long journey. He ate and drank to his heart's content and was making merry with tales of the wondrous tower that had sprung up in Kalala. With honest curiosity, 
he inquired as to the nature of this special tool, the Kam Agastirach. There are no words to describe such a device as Thor. You'll have to handle it yourself to understand, answered Ashling, with an enigmatic smile. It's at the bottom of that big old wooden chest, and I can neither reach it nor lift it. Jumping up from his seat, the young man reached deep into the chest, intrigued by the mysterious object. With his backside pointed skywards and his toes barely touching the floor, Ashling seized her opportunity. As quick as lightning, she grabbed him by his feet and tossed him upside down into the chest. Before he had a chance to object, she shut the lid on the box with a bang. Once the shouts of upset and shock died down, Ashling politely explained that she would provide him with a candle and writing materials. He could use these to write a letter to his father, instructing him to release her husband and the Gobon Ser right away. Of course, she reassured him that he would also be freed upon their return. And so, the trio took off with letter in hand across the country. And the poor man bouncing about inside the chest on the back of the cart behind them. Reaching Kalala, Ashling immediately presented A with the letter and indicated to the noisy box that contained his son. Although vexed, the wealthy man could hardly refuse its demand, especially with his own son held captive by this capable young woman. Begrudgingly, he returned to erect the scaffold once more, calling up to the stranded men that they would soon be freed. As the wooden planks rose up around the tower, the Gobon Ser turned to his son and said solemnly, All these years I have underestimated you, Pather. But I see now that, together with your fair wife, you have done your family, your community, and yourself proud. But there isn't a prouder father in Ireland this day than myself. At last, the scaffold reached the top, and the pair descended safely down. Upon reaching solid ground, they were greeted by Ashling and Dervla, who recounted their own adventures with tears and laughter. A and his son were also reunited, although with less laughter and more dirty looks and frowns of disapproval and disappointment. News of the rich man who thought he owned the entire village spread quickly throughout the countryside, and the locals couldn't help but shake their heads and chuckle at his antics. They threw a hooli, the likes of which hadn't been seen in Kalala for a century or more. The Gobon Ser and his family joined in on the festivities, revelling in the joy and laughter that filled the air until the early hours of the morning. As the sun began to rise, a sense of peace and contentment settled over the village, and they took this opportunity to bless the newly erected round tower a symbol of unity and harmony, restored once again. A had hoped to carve his legacy in stone, leaving an everlasting mark on the world. 
and indeed he had achieved that end, though not in the illustrious way he had envisioned. Instead, his name would forever be linked to envy and folly, a cautionary tale for generations to come. As the final stone was laid, marking the completion of the tower, the legend of the Gobon Ser, the master builder, took flight. His reputation ascended to unprecedented heights, as tall as the tower itself. Ashling and Pather continued to forge a name for themselves in the community. With Ashling's support, Pather transformed from an unpolished stone into a gem of newfound skills. He emerged as a craftsman, matching his father's finesse, and as a storyteller whose tales echoed through every home. He was no longer just his father's son. He earned his own recognition and respect. As dusk descended over Kalala, the yellow moon glowed above their finished tower. They reflected on how this towering stone structure had transformed their lives. The Gobon Ser's heritage was now safeguarded by Pather's emerging skills and Ashling's unwavering intellect, each of them contributing uniquely to their success. Almost a thousand years have passed, and the round tower of Kalala still stands proud today keeping a watchful eye over the tiny fishing village in the west of Ireland. It remains a monument to the skill, wit, resilience and determination of the people of Ireland. As the stars shimmer above the ancient tower, let the peaceful sounds of the Atlantic coast guide you into restful dreams. Imagine the lapping waves, the distant call of seagulls, and the gentle breeze as you drift off to sleep. Thank you for joining me tonight. Sweet dreams, and may you wake refreshed and ready for a new day. Until next time, sleep well, dream deeply, and remember, every dream holds a story. Ihawai. Good night.